how does food affect our brain? The people eat a lot of carbohydrates and sugars and starches have much more violent behavior. Kids can't learn in school because mm -hmm. they're eating Doritos and Coke. You know, I say food is medicine. It's not just like a medicine. It works faster, better, and cheaper than almost any drug. And I look at myself now doing far less exercise, and I'm far more muscular and have more muscle mass than I did when I was 28 because I learned how to change my diet. And we know... that people eat a lot of carbohydrates and sugars and starches have much more violent behavior. Mm. We know that people eat refined oils, which we now have 10% of these as our calories from soybean oil. It's in everything. It's not like so we put it in our food. It's in every packaged processed food. <clears throat> that has led to increase in homicides and violence and suicides around the world. And we've gotten higher on these refined omega-6s and low on omega-3s. So the evidence of how it affects behavior, mood, poverty, it keeps poor communities down. And then the food industry targets these communities disproportionately. So you have all these things happening at the same time. And then kids, kids can't learn in school because they're eating Doritos and Coke and they can't actually focus and learn and their behavior is all erratic and they're on these chemicals which alter their behavior. That's why you know one out of six kids has some neurodevelopmental problem, which is enormous, right? So we always say there's five causes of all disease based on how they influence your genetics and combine with your lifestyle. Toxins, so environmental toxins, that's not your fault, that's just, the fact that we put 80,000 chemicals in the environment without testing them. We have 3,000 food ads we eat every year. And, you know, there are heavy metals and pesticides everywhere. So it, we're exposed to a lot of toxins and they make people sick. Infections, which we can get, whether it's viral infections and bacterial infections, Lyme disease, tick infections, uh, allergens, which are increasingly common, and, or food sensitivities, things where your body's creating an immune response, whether it's gluten or dairy, those are big. And then poor diet and stress. All of those are contributing to disease. But by far, the biggest cause is food. Really? By far. So. Yeah, I mean, I always say food is medicine. It's not just like a medicine. It works faster, better, and cheaper than almost any drug. I mean, we have people who are off insulin, who are type 2 diabetics, within a week. Wow. You know, and, and get off all their medications. I mean, there was a huge study just published on a ketogenic diet intervention for type 2 diabetics. And I don't think ketogenic diets are right for everybody, but in an extreme situation where your metabolism is so broken, it can help reset things. Basically, mm -hmm. reducing carbs to 30 grams a day, 70% fat, and help in the context of a healthy, plant-rich diet. And they were able to get 100% of the people in a year over diabetics off of the main diabetes medication and 94% off insulin or dramatically lower with an average weight loss of 30 pounds. Yeah, yeah. In other words, I haven't spent my life dedicated to the low fat diet. I haven't been dedicated my life to Paleo veganism. Or... I mean, I, I'm looking at like what works. And the other thing I know is that I'm not an academic. Well, I do research, but that's not how I started. I'm a practicing doctor. So what's happened over the years is the latest thing comes in, I try it, see what happens, see what happens to the patient. So seeing tens of thousands of patients doing thousands and thousands of lab tests over the years, seeing what happens when people change their diet and how their biology responds, that's the best laboratory you'll ever right, see. Right. And I even, I even noticed it myself, I was a vegetarian for 10 years, and I see pictures of myself when I was 28, and I am so scrawny, even though I ate really healthy, I ran five miles a day, I did yoga all the time, and I look at myself now doing far less exercise, and I'm far more muscular and have more muscle mass than I did when I was 28, because I learned how to change my diet. And we know that, that the right kind of high, high fat diet and, and, and adequate protein actually increases muscle mass. People go, well, we shouldn't be eating meat because it's bad for the animals, bad for the environment. Right. Yes, we should not be eating factory farm meat. This is really bad. It's bad for the animals, it's bad for the planet, it's bad for us because the quality of the meat is very poor. But let's say a wild elk or a grass-finished bison or even cow, very different. And it turns out that these animals actually have higher levels of omega-3 fats and higher levels of antioxidants and minerals and nutrients and beneficial fats and, and actually are a great source of protein and don't have the harm that we think they do. When you look yeah. at the studies that showed there was harm, the reason they show that is because when you do a study, observational study, you give people a questionnaire every year. So you take 10,000 people, 100,000 people, and every year you give them a questionnaire, what'd you eat? What'd you eat last week? What'd you, you know, if you can remember. And people answer according to what they think they should answer a lot of times, right? So if meat is bad, they're gonna underestimate the amount of meat they're eating. So during the time of these studies, meat was considered bad. So people who ate meat didn't really care about their health. So they smoke, and the data show it. When you look at the factors of these people, their characteristics, which you can read in the studies, which I read, they were overweight, they smoked, they drank, 
they didn't eat fruits and vegetables, they didn't exercise, they didn't take vitamins, they ate more processed food, more sugar, of course they were sicker. Well, you know, I always, I always joke, because I, I used to teach a lot of churches, and I go, if, ask yourself one question when you're shopping. Did God make this, or did man make this, right? Did God make a Twinkie? No. <laughs> did God make an avocado? Yeah, pretty right. simple rule. Yeah. And you can even take that to its logical extreme. Did God make a feedlot cow? No. Did God make a grass-fed cow? Yes, right? Sure. So you can kind of go down the line on all that. That's the first principle. The second principle is we should be eating mostly plant-based diet. Yeah. We call it plant-rich. I call it plant-rich. Yeah, 80-20, right? So yeah, 80%, 70% of your plant of your foods on your plate should be lots of vegetables, nuts and seeds, fruit, whole foods. And the third principle is we need a lot of good fats. Avocados, olive oil. I think there's controversies about certain things. Nuts and seeds are good, but then there's the whole saturated fat debate, which we can get into where refined oils. But essentially, we need a lot of good fats, low starch and sugar, plant-rich diet, and you know, stay away from processed food. Yeah. And I also talk about how do you eat, not just for your own health, right? But what is the overall footprint of the food you eat? What's the health footprint, the economic footprint, the carbon footprint, the environmental footprint, the educational footprint, the national security footprint, and even poverty and social justice footprint of what you eat? Because there are things we can't change as individuals. We can't end nuclear war. We can't, mm. you know, single-handedly, you know, end climate change. But we can change what we eat because we do it all the time. Louis, hey, we are in a mental health crisis. Uh, we are in a immune crisis. We are in a food crisis. We are in a social crisis that that is sort of likes of which we I don't think we've seen in our lifetime. We have we have gotten so um, confused about what to eat, and 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 our diet has changed so much that it's driving so many chronic diseases. And most people don't understand the connection between food and mood. Mm. So to your question, how does food affect our brain? About how the body affects the mind. We often know about the mind-body effect, which is real, but there's also the other direction going on. And it turns out that food is probably the biggest driver of dysfunction in the brain when it comes to mood, behavior, attention, memory. And, and this is not just sort of hypothetical, but there's a whole department, for example, at uh, Harvard of nutritional psychiatry. There's a whole hmm. department at Stanford of metabolic psychiatry. I've had both of them on my podcast, The Doctor's Pharmacy. The doctors from those institutions are talking about the role of food and, and the brain and the mood. And we see depression, anxiety, irritability, stress. It turns out that when you eat the American diet, or otherwise known as the SAD diet, the standard American <laughs> diet, that, that people uh, are damaging their brains in ways that create inflammation in the brain. And so the food that we're eating, predominantly the sugar and starch and processed ingredients, additives, the lack of good fats, the predominance of bad fats and refined oils, the nutrient depletion of our diet. I mean, 95% of us are deficient probably in omega-3 fats. Uh, you know, 90 plus percent of Americans are deficient in one or more nutrients at the minimum level to prevent deficiency, which all play a role in the mood like folate, magnesium is incredible for anxiety, iron, zinc, all these, vitamin D, all these play a role in the brain function. I mean, you hear about winter blues, you know, that's because of lack of vitamin D. So we know about this intimate connection between food and mood and uh, nutritional status and mood. And, and the clinical trials have been really staggering, showing that people who eat a whole foods diet and get rid of the junk actually can get rid of depression. Uh, I see panic attacks, anxiety disorders, often caused by the food we're eating. Just an example, when you eat sugar or starch, your cortisol level goes up, which is the stress hormone. Your adrenaline goes up. So if you eat a bagel or a cookie, your body literally has the same reaction as if you're running from a saber-toothed tiger. There's a whole cascade of things that happens when you eat mostly the starch and sugar that's 60% of our diet, right? It's ultra-processed food. Mm -hmm. It's the main ingredients of corn and flour and sugar that are in everything. And, and what happens is you get this spike in blood sugar, which then creates a spike in insulin, at the same time, you get an immediate spike in cortisol and adrenaline. That's the first phase of response. Of course, it affects your liver and screws up your cholesterol and all that. But what happens next is even more concerning. It, it drives all the available fuel in your bloodstream from all the food you've eaten, sugar and starch and whatever bad fats, it drives it into your fat cells. And it's a one-way street into your fat cells called your adipocytes around your belly, those belly fat cells. Those fat cells, in turn, 
create a whole series of chemicals, like hundreds of chemicals, hormones, inflammatory marker. Eat in that way, it drives hunger, it stores fat, it shuts down your metabolism, and it slows, literally slows your metabolism. And even worse, it locks the fat cells so that fat can't get out. Uh. It's like a one-way turnstile, only get in. What happens to the brain when you don't eat real whole foods and you eat too much of this uh, American diet that we're, we're all eating, it disconnects the frontal lobe from the amygdala. Now, what does that mean in English? The frontal lobe is a grown-up. It's the adult in the room. It's like, it's like you think you're going to punch that guy, but you go, I better not punch that guy, right? Right, <laughs> like right, it's right. That, it's, that, it's that adult in the room that sort of is your higher self. And the amygdala is your reptile brain. It's your lizard brain. It's going to just run or fight or flee. Uh -huh. and, it's, and, and what happens is literally physiologically, these parts of the brain are connected. But when you eat crap, they get disconnected. And so you're constantly reacting from your amygdala with no grown-up in the room, which is why we see this level of divisiveness and hatred. And I mean, just all the upheaval we're seeing in society now, I think a large part of that has to do with uh, our brains being constantly triggered by this reptilian uh, insult that is driving uh, behavior change. And when we look at, at and we look at the fact of, of other data to support, it's not just a theory. In prisons, if you give prisoners healthy food, swapping out all the crap they eat in prisons, which is pretty darn bad, there's a 56% reduction in violent crime in the wow. prisons. If you add a multivitamin, it's an 80% reduction. Come on. And they took these kids and they and they, uh, these were kids who were disruptive, violent, aggressive, oppositional, suicidal. It was by cleaning up their diet and giving them whole foods, there was a 91% reduction in all violent behavior. You know, oppositional behavior, need for restraints went down. Suicide went down 100%. I mean, it's the third leading cause of death in that age group. It went down 100%, no, no wow. suicides. And so you see this incredible data that comes from understanding nutritional psychiatry. And you go, wait a minute, maybe some of our messed up society has to do with not only the problems with obesity and the problems of chronic disease and the fact that COVID is, is uh, landed on a perfect, you know, uh, laboratory for spreading in America because we're all so unhealthy and our immune systems are so sick because of our diet. But it's also led to this incredible disruption of our brain and our, and our um, mood and our behavior, which we're seeing at rampant in society today.